Hi everyone, I am Connie Zach, co-owner of Sunlighten, and I'm here on my favorite series called Enlighten with Sunlighten. It's my favorite series because we get the opportunity to talk to experts in the field that will enlighten you on their expertise and you have so many, you'll have so many takeaways. Uh, so today I get to have our um, Sunlighten friend, just amazing, beautiful um, person. I just love Dr. Lee. She is a cognitive pathologist and neuroscientist and author of many best-selling books. And uh, one of you know my favorite is right here, which is cleaning up your mental mess. And she's going to talk to us about that as, long, as well as other things today. Welcome, Dr. Lee. So happy to have you. Thank you, Connie. It's so nice to talk to you again. You and I always have such wonderful talks. And we can go on for hours and hours. And you, you're sitting in one of my favorite places in your saunas. I mean, I, that is my go-to sanctuary every single day. I am Aww. such a Sunlight and fan, so, and thank I think I've so taught some, every single person about your saunas, so it's, thank you, thank you for, thank you for creating them, honestly, they are amazing. Oh, thank you so much, thank you for the feedback, and thank you for the kind words, so let's get started, because I have a lot of questions for you, and there's so much great information in this book, and as I was saying, you know, before we went live, this topic of, you know, mindset and mental health and mindfulness and preparing the brain, all of the things so important right now. I just feel like it couldn't be more important than, you know, this moment in time. So I'm just so thrilled to have your brain um, and your beauty you know, on, our, on our show uh, today. So tell, let's get started with explaining what was the impetus, what was the reason that you wrote this, the book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess? Mess. Well, Connie, one of the main things is being in the field for 38 years and doing all this clinical research and clinical trials and clinical application and therapy, I really saw very early on in my work that we all need to have a mind management technique. So while I was parallel to initially when I developed these systems and did the research on the mind brain connect, mind brain body connection, psycho neurobiology, I was very much in a therapeutic world dealing with people with severe trauma and learning disabilities and traumatic brain injuries and and I saw how well the system that I uh, was developing was working for them. It, it was making dramatic differences and we were seeing like 35 to 75 percent improvement in people's cognitive, emotional, social functioning. In people that had been written off by the medical community had been written off as vegetables had been literally like uh, literally hopeless and they were coming with going back to school going to university going back and changing their careers and just getting their life on track and so very quickly i adapted it into a day-to-day -day kind of system um, that anyone can use because we all have a mind and our mind is driving the brain and the brain drives the body and we've got this network between the mind brain body and so Fast forward all these years, I did years and years and years of research, constantly refining and developing and writing lots of different books. And this book is the the most updated version. There's some of my clinic, my most recent clinical trials I've put into the book. Um, and I do research to try and constantly improve the system and improve my knowledge and make my system more and more accessible to people because at the end of the day, every single person has a mind and our mind drives our brain. And the difference between an alive person and a dead person is the mind. And if our mind is a mess, our, life, our brain and body and life will be a mess. And we can do all these incredible things, but if we don't have our mind right, then we we don't get the same kind of benefit from all the other things. Like even your soreness. I mean, I am an avid fan, as you know. It's every single day I go, that's where I detox, that's where I relax. But I really have to get my mind right to really get the full benefit. So if I get into the sauna and I'm all worked up and my mind is a mess, I will do the neurocycle. I'll go, I'll go through the system I've developed to get the benefit out of the sauna. And certainly being in the sauna facility, it's that process. I can I can tell you, it's really my as I keep saying, it's my go-to relaxation. So I wrote this book to present the most um, accessible version of my system yet to everyone, whether no matter what age you are. I mean, just prior to this discussion starting, you and I were chatting about kids battling with sleep and anxiety, and it's a question I get all the time. I have four of my own adult children, and it's something I've dealt with for years. So this book's also for children. It's for adults. It's for humans that um, but we, we all have a mind and we all need to manage our mind and it's basically like a system that it, it, I teach you the the basic fundamental issues of what mental health actually is what it isn't and if we look at mental health in the incorrect way how that holds us back and locks us into things that we shouldn't be locked into and so this book helps to set you free and to recognize hey it's okay to have have 
depression and anxiety. These are very normal things. This is what they are. And this is how you manage them. This is how you deal with trauma. This is how you deal with toxic habits. This is how you build good habits. This is how you learn to sleep again. You know, this is how you learn to just have that level of peace and dealing with the uncertainties of life and, you know, just being alive. And that's really what I've tried to do with this book. Well, you've done a really great job. And I, I want to stay on that for a second because we were talking before um, about how the approach used to, or not used to be, I guess still is. Um, I, I think it used to be because, you know, I've been reading this um, uh, about treating. Okay. So first the, the stigma is I, I want you to talk about, I really want you to help people um, address that because that I feel like that is so much of what's keeping people from moving um, as well as like just sharing your thoughts on, you know, medication and kind of that that approach versus your approach and 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 your thoughts behind why you know you're so passionate about this approach absolutely so first of all do you want to begin with a stigma yeah Maybe that would be great labeling. yes so, please okay so great so mental health um, has been mismanaged, in my opinion, for years. There's been very few periods in history where mental health has been dealt with well. But there's certain groups of, groups of people and there's certain periods in history where mental health has been held, de dealt with well. And in those, if you look at what they did, what they did was they were very human about it. They were just basically, okay, well, we life has tough situations and when sometimes it gets too much, we break down, we need to process that, we need support, we move on. And whenever a period in history or a group of people has adopted that philosophy, it has been extremely successful. And then there's a whole body of research showing that when we, as part of our humanity, is dealing with adverse circumstances and being able to process through them and to be able to, to deal with the fact that we're not going to always feel great and that that is quite normal and that if we've had, if we've been a victim of terrible things, there isn't a lesson to be learned in that there is a healing process that needs to be take, taken place taking place so it's all about so if you take that fast forward to where we are today and the 40 years i've been in this 38 years i've been in this field the last 40 years there was a massive shift once again and that shift was not in a good direction it was in the direction of as we understood more about the brain which is a very good thing we became so enamored with the brain that everything became about the brain, 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 brain. And everything about you as a person was sort of put to the side. And everything was about the brain. And even the word mental health became this negative thing. Meanwhile, mental health is, mental is mind. Mind is part of your humanity. You can go three weeks without food. You can go three days without water. You can go three minutes without oxygen. But you don't even go three seconds without using your mind. So mental activity is part of being alive. It's part of being human. Human. You go to bed with your mind, you dream with your mind, you sleep with your mind, you wake up with your mind, you eat with your mind, you have this conversation with your mind. Your mind never stops. So what we should be saying is that mind, mental, those things, those are fantastic. They're incredible parts of being a human. They enable us to experience the, the joys of, of love and marriage and kids and and, and friendship and, and excitement and passion and, and also the downs, that the things that we, we can experience, we can feel the sadness and that is all part of being human. And that's it's all part of a mind experience. So if we shift our perspective back to humans in life experiencing the ups and downs, the mental is how we experience that. The mind is how we experience that. The mind is the 90 to 99% of who we are. It is our processing aspect. We in life, the environment of life, and life is filled with experiences. And it's with our mind that we alive, our aliveness, our mind, that we then process those experiences into the brain. And it's the beautiful relationship between the mind and the brain that then that then enables us to actually express and, and work from what we've experienced. So here people are listening to us talk now about mental health so it's sound waves and electromagnetic light waves and words so on a scientific level there's all this electromagnetic quantum gravitational field stuff happening and on a psychological level people are thinking feeling and choosing about what they are hearing that's all mind activity that's all pushed into the brain and then the brain responds electromagnetically and genetically and uh, neurochemically. And the result is that our conversation is being converted into vibrations stored inside little proteins that group together to form branches and that ultimately group together to form a tree, like little thought trees. So I'm holding a little tree in a pot and the little, um, the, as each, each, every, 
as, as you know, every tree that you plant is always going to have a root system. So this little root system over here then produces the branches. Now that's a th tree. That's exactly what a thought looks like. You are growing trees in your brain right now as you're listening to me. So the source of the, the root system would be the source. So what we're saying, what I'm saying, or discussion would be in the root system because that's the source. The tree is called mental health. And then mm -hmm. the branches are your unique interpretation of what you're hearing. And this is what we're doing all day long. We do this 8,000 to 10,000 thousand times a day so in any one day when we're awake we are experiencing around about eight thousand to ten thousand events with our mind and with our mind we push it into the brain and we store what we experience in the brain in these physical protein tree-like structures the brain then sends a message to the rest of the body the rest of the brain and body and there's a dna change related to this memory and then also in the gravitational fields of our mind which are sort of all around us and through us which is the energy force that we pick up on ekg technology Technology and QEG technology, which is not there when you're dead. When you're dead, there is no action. There's no energy. So our mind is all this energy, and so it's, so, it's, so the the thought, the experience, the um, that we're having is stored in the brain as a tree in the body in our DNA, and also in the energy fields of the brain, um, of, of the mind around and through the body. So three places. So this is then then this is what we use to then communicate and function and whatever so everything that you do in your life like all the stuff that you've done with, with sunlight and sauna you've got all these trees in your brain that enable you to talk about your your field so that's then we also have the bad experiences so he has a toxic tree a toxic thought tree and the root would be then the, the source of the pain and the branches would be your interpretation so let's say that that's an abuse that's happening to a young child their interpretations got the obvious it's distorted so it's a distorted interpretation this shifts the identity and how they think feel and choose about themselves and if it's a continued pattern that's not processed and this could be any kind of abuse i mean any any kind of trauma whether it's bullying at school whether it's worrying about the isolation of a pandemic whatever um that is the source and then that's the interpretation and if this is not processed this then shows up in how we are functioning in our emotions our behaviors our perspective of life the physical sensations in our body and all of those showing up are signals telling us hey there's something that you need to deal with because this is a structure that is different to this the proteins in this are folded correctly there's a chemical electrical chemical balance that is correct but in this one it's not these proteins are folded incorrectly there's distorted information it's all the vibrations are distorted information the data the feelings all the all the experience is all inter, it, 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 it distorted so for example someone who's had a lot of sexual abuse they'll see themselves as shame and terrible mm. and I'm not worthy mm. and I can't and you know that shows up in relationships and and it's and this could be bullying a child that's bullied a lot at school and they don't know how to deal with it like there was just an example in the paper the other day of a child of eight years old who committed suicide from constant bullying so that child didn't know how to process it would have been experiencing all that bullying interpreting that as I'm useless whatever all these things that I hate myself people hate me I'm not worthy um and that not knowing how to express it was maybe showing up with behavioral symptoms and eventually crashed, this system crashed and that child couldn't carry on. And this is happening way too often, you know, and so we live in a society that is not allowing our children and ourselves to actually process this because these, what's, what's happening is when these symptoms show up in behavioral, emotional, physical and perspective kind of signals, the, 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 the medical model, the disease model has lumped that in the same category as something like diabetes or cancer. And it's so wrong because something like diabetes or cancer or, or the physical ailments of the physical body can be very clearly identified with various different types of blood tests and various different ways, as you know, with all the different technology we have. Uh -huh. But something like a mind issue, you can't go and say that that symptom of depression and that symptom of this anxiety and panic attacks and, and not being able to concentrate, you can't say that those are symptoms of a disease because they're not symptoms of a disease. Uh -huh. you know, it's, I love it's, that. Cir it's circular reasoning. What they are, because you can't be depression. It's not a being, it's a doing. So you are experiencing depression because of, you aren't depression. But the current model says you are depression. You're depression because you have a neuropsychiatric brain disease. So there's something wrong with your brain and therefore that's why you are um, having these symptoms. So they want to identify the symptoms and then label that. Labels lock you in, stigmatize you, and then they want to basically medicate or give techniques and yeah therapy is really great i mean therapy is so important i can't stress that enough but 
you can't just it's not a simple of 10 cbt tick exercise or weeks of 10 weeks of cbt a drug and then it all goes away and if it doesn't go away i'm sorry live with it the rest of your life that is the most um, negative um, and hopeless message that has been sold to people and the whole chemical imbalance myth is a myth totally it's not a scientific fact it has been never was proven and no scientist or doctor worth a grain of salt should be talking about that it's a really great marketing tool and it has sold and it's been used to try and simplify depression but we don't we can't we you can't they're trying to simplify something that actually doesn't need to be validated as a medical disease model it's actually an insult to humanity when we try and validate something as big as depression as a a, and package it in a disease it is so important to deal with depression and anxiety not because they are it's because you can't be depression, but because they are signals of something that's going on in your life. And if we keep this and don't deal with this, the symptoms will get worse and worse. And not only that, because this is a distorted, um, a, a damaging um, real structure in the brain, like our brain will reject something like COVID virus and by, by the immune system, the, the immune system of the brain recognizes a toxic thought or a trauma, toxic trauma in the same way. It sees this as, okay, this is a foreign invader. This shouldn't be there. This is a threat to your survival. So in exactly the same way that the immune system sends out T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes and macrophages to the site of the of COVID, the uh -huh. COVID virus, it does the same thing to this. It's basically sending out that to try and fight this. But if you don't deal with it, you then get an autoimmune response. And then your body starts fighting against you and your inflammation increases and you have a downstream effect into your hormones and your DNA literally almost immediately gets affected. I didn't work with tel telomeres and we can maybe talk about that as we're going along because it's also very significant around um, heat. Telomeres also impacted by that. But our telomeres are the ends of chromosomes and they are very much related, um, involved in how we, in cell division. And we make about a million cells every second. So if our mind is a mess, it affects our um, our brain, our body, it also affects our DNA. And, and our DNA, if I'm crossing my fingers, chromosome looks like a little X. And the, my fingernails would be what we call the telomeres, which are the ends of chromosomes. And those telomeres need to be nice and strong. So your nails need to be nice and strong, in inverted commas, for the cells to actually be healthy. And if you're making a million cells every second, but your mind is a mess, your mind affects the telomeres. They get weaker and weaker, which means your cells get weaker and weaker, which means that your cells make up your organs of your body and you. So therefore, you get weaker and weaker. So we see that accumulated toxic issues builds up a terrible um, a vulnerability in the brain and the body that comes out as the poor sleep, the physical illnesses, the increased anxiety, etc., etc. So we kind of, then, then we go to address that with like drugs and a label. And initially the label might make you feel better because you think, oh, well, that's why I feel better. Mm -hmm. So you can, so instead of saying it as a label, as an it, say, okay, I am experiencing depression because of, that's a way safer say, it's thing to say than saying I have clinical depression because that locks you in, that stigmatizes you and that is incorrect science and it's not what's happening. It's better to say I am experiencing depression and GI issues and heart palpitations and my, and I, my perspective of life is that it sucks and I'm really battling to concentrate and battling with my relationships. It's better to say that and then you say because of I'm still an amazing person I'm a beautiful person I have an incredible identity there's something I can do that no one else can do I am not I, my identity is not broken things have happened to me that have affected my identity that have affected how I'm functioning so now I need to become a thought detective to unpack why I'm going through these things and do the work of cha of, of reconceptualizing that whole process. And that's totally different to what's, what I'm saying now is not right. what's happening. What's happening is they're saying, oh, depression, anxiety, disease, symptoms of a disease, bad label, sub, uh, you know, get rid of them, drug them. And, you know, there's something wrong with you. Meanwhile, we are living in a society where things are wrong. There's racism, there's COVID, there's the pandemic, there's isolation, there's, there's trauma all over the place. So, and we are totally impacted by environment. And those stories are the stories of our lives that are causing these signals. So we need to look at the signals to find the story, to help the person manage the story. You can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what's happening in you. And that's what we need to empower people to do. So I'm trying to help people recognize, hey, it's okay, you're amazing. But you have had things happen to you. It's okay, it's part of life. Let's now understand this, unpack this, deconstruct this and reconstruct this to help you make this work for you and not against you. That was so, a long answer. Sorry. Uh, no, that was a great answer. And like, 
every time you said another statement, I'm like, okay, that is such a, a, a wise pearl of you know wisdom. And one of my favorite things I said at the beginning about doing it like was like with doing the series is I mean, my goal is just to get one or two, you know, nuggets from it that you can apply in, you know, your own life. And you just gave me like 25. I mean, there's, there's, so, there's so, so many with just with the mindset of, you know, that looking at, I'm experiencing X, Y, or Z. I am experiencing sleeplessness. I'm experiencing anxiety. I am experiencing, you know, thoughts about, like, that's such a better way to say that versus, you know, I have insomnia, or I have depression, or I have Absolutely. anxiety, whatever. And so that in itself, I mean, there were so many other great things that you said, but I, I love that that frame. I mean, I say it all the time, you know, to my kids, it's, it's, it's mindset, you know, like don't, like when they'll say something, that something will come out of their mouth. I'm like, okay, so let's reframe that. Yeah. <laughs> let's say that in a different way, because, I mean, you know, my intuitiveness is if I'm saying something, it's, and I don't know, I'm not a neuroscientist, nowhere close, but I, I feel but like... You, but you're following your instincts, I don't mean to right. you, but you're following your instincts, and that's love, you're doing the right thing. Well, thank you. I mean, I feel like if I say, if I hear my kids say, you know, I can't do this, or whatever, just use a very simple example, I'm like, no, 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 because now you're telling your brain that, and it's much more difficult to untell your brain than it is to tell your brain the right thing is my I mean that's my very very late um, very approach good. so um, okay so before we I have another question I have a zillion questions but I want to make sure I tell the audience and our listeners and viewers that um, we will be uh, I will be taking your questions towards the end so even if you can't stay on for the entire time uh, we will still answer them and I will post them in the in the chat section so Please go ahead and ask your questions. I will get to that, I promise. And I always go on afterwards, even for several days, if somebody watches it later and they have questions. And, and if I can't answer that, um, then you know I will get the answer from Dr. Lee. We'll make sure we get you uh, the, the information you need. I mean, especially with this topic, it just really couldn't be, as I said, more important right now. So, um, okay, so many questions. So I'll start with like the just foundational question. Um, I loved your um, hot tub story in your book about getting your diamond earring. I mean, that was just so fantastic. I was like, oh my gosh, I can totally relate to every single part of that story, especially at the oh, end when you're like, I mean, you know, your, your husband like, hello, why didn't you tell me to take off my earring? So anyway, for those of you who haven't read, read, read the book, um, it's a great story to help walk us through the five, you know, simple steps that Dr. Lee um, talks about in the book um, to five ways to help relieve anxiety and, and stress. So can you take us, you know, through maybe just a high level of those steps to so sure. know? Sure. I wanted to just start that by answering, uh, just commenting what you what you told your kids. And so that's really great. That's what we do. We want to reframe. It's so good that we always think about, um, we've got to remember that at the core of who we are, identity is our is, is critical. When your identity feels crushed, people lose hope. And that's when we see deaths of despair. We see suicides. And I've worked with a lot of suicide um, survivors and family and victims and things, uh, victims and families that who have lost someone. And I can tell you, the con and if you look at the research, the consistent thing with suicide and, and attempted suicide and, and a lot of suicidal ideation is this feeling that um, I'm not, I have no value in this world. And that's why there's such a massive emphasis that I place on um, identity and on believing. And I'm going to be talking more and more about it. I just did a podcast this week on that. And I can't stress that enough. So when you tell your kids, hey, let's reframe that. It's not that it's you. It's what you're going through. It is one of the most critical statements that we can give each other and our children. And I tell ourselves as well. It's not a being. It's a doing. So these are, it's 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 not who you are. It's what's happened to you. It's what you have. Um, it's it's part of your brain that's wired in. And then you explain that really well. It does wire into your brain because, as I was saying, everything is experienced by the mind, and then the mind then wires it into the brain and the body and the mind. So it's in three places. I mean, you can tell your kids what your experience is in in your brain as a tree. It's in your DNA in these in the DNA just in the cells of the DNA is the easy way just to explain. And it's also in these fields around you. So it's very real. It's not that what you are experiencing is not real. It's incredibly real. And the more you think about it, the more it gets, the stronger it gets. So then you're going to grow more branches and you're going to give it more energy and the tree more energy. It gets more and more 
water being fed to it and you've got to decide do you want to because that kind of energy is very heavy it's a bird this is a burden this is not a burden this weighs you down this lifts you up Mm-hmm. And so, you know, these are great with kids. It's if you're talking about kids any age, I mean, anyone, adults too, just to have these two analogies, why I use them all the time. It's a very, very good way of visualizing and picturing this because we, we, not, we don't have to be run by these. And the medical model currently says, well, this is who you are. You have to be run by these and you need drugs to control this. That's not the truth. Your mind overrides drugs anyway. There's so much evidence showing that you can have a drug and if your mind is not right, you're not going to get the full benefit anyway. You can even override it. Classic example is sleeping medications. People can take a whole ton of sleeping medications and if they're still anxious and worried, they'll just override the medication and they literally, unless they get full on anesthetics, they're not going to be knocked out. So that will get bigger and bigger the more we think about it. And a habit forms over 63 days, not 21. So if you are, and nine, nine, nine weeks or 63 days may sound like a long time, but if you are consistently in an environment where day after day you are receiving the same bullying mm-hmm. or you are, I mean, we were in isolation for 15 months or 14 months. You know, it's only now that we are starting to move around a bit more in various states and countries and so on. Um, but it basically the whole, that nine weeks of isolation changed our lives completely. So we wired a toxic COVID um, experience into our brain. There's lockdown, there's our interpretation. And, you know, that's that's uh, that's why there's a lot of sleep issues and, and um, a lot of, because we don't know how to process this. We should be processing this more and dealing with this more. So that's what the five steps do. The five steps is called the neurocycle. And I developed it 38 years ago initially, and I first developed a theory, and I developed it initially for people with traumatic brain injuries and Alzheimer's, dementias, severe learning disabilities, cognitive impairments, heavy sexual trauma, war trauma, that kind of stuff. And then I adapted it to um, a a learning, uh, basically how to build your brain in education and how to manage your emotions, so for kids, and then I adapted it to all age levels. So over the 38 years, the system has been developed and adapted, and the most updated version is in the book called The NeuroCycle, Mm -hmm. and it is not a technique. You can do any techniques in that. I mean, like, for example, the fifth step is is active reach and its actions. And, you know, one of the things that I'll often say in my active reaches is have an infrared sauna. It's, you know, do something to physically relax your body. Because if you think about this, that memory is is in your brain as a tree. It's in your body, in your DNA, every cell of your body. And it's in the gravitational fields of your mind. When you go into an infrared sauna, you're changing all of those fields in your brain, body, and mind. So you are calming down the neurochemical chaos mm-hmm. that is trans has transpired from something like this. So you're going to get more clarity of mind. And when you have more clarity of mind, you have more wisdom and you can deal with your stuff. So I love to um, to use things like the infrared sauna, breathing, meditation, tapping, havening, all that kind of thing as brain preparation and as active reaches. So in two in two um, phases. So the neurocycle, you need to prepare your brain for the neurocycle. And then as you're doing the neurocycle, there is the first step is always an action step. So you can use these different things, um, as I said, in both places. And that's incredibly important. So it's always a brain preparation. And then once you've prepared your brain, you then move through the five steps. The five steps are like a delivery system. And I always use the example of Amazon, whether people like Amazon or not, it is an incredibly effective delivery system. It uh-huh. can deliver anything, anywhere, anytime. Uh-huh. That's what the neurocycle is. It's also, it's the Amazon of the mind, basically. It's your delivery uh-huh. system of your mind. Um, you can do any therapy, any technique, any meditation, any diet, any program in that because it's simply going to make it work. It's uh-huh. how you make things work. Because with your mind, you actually are learning about the program. It's, your, it's with your mind that you're processing the information, with your mind that you make the decision to carry out the program. You know, when we're doing exercise, it's our mind that's driving the DNA effectiveness in our cells. So if we go into an exercise routine with a negative mindset or I just want to get this over, you're uh-huh. going to lose most of the effectiveness of that of that workout and the sauna session and the food that you've just eaten and the um, conversation you just had. So our mind is driving everything. We have to get our mind into this ideal state that we can then in manage situations. So the easiest way to learn the neurocycle is to look at to find a pattern in your life that is disruptive. Mm-hmm. And and once you've identified that pattern, then to sit down daily for 15 to 45 minutes. So it's not long. You can do 15 to 45. Don't do longer than 45. You can do even seven minutes. Seven to 45 minutes is the ideal time that I recommend. And I mean I do it when I'm getting ready in the morning. It's a lifestyle. 
neurocycling is a lifestyle it's not a one-off thing that you do and then for the first 21 days you stick you work through the five steps in that time frame so if you're doing 15 minutes you're spending three minutes per step and you get strict with yourself so you get to a point and you haven't quite finished but you must go to the next step haven't quite finished you go to the next step because tomorrow you pick up and it's those little bits of building that you are rewiring the brain so to come back to your kids and what you told them is that if you keep doing it you keep if you keep saying those things you've kind of made it part of your brain you have it's part of your brain as you do it but you're making it stronger and stronger if you keep the negative thinking around it but if you do but you can rewire that this doesn't have to become your um, future are you still there um hold on Dimitri, somebody, it, I, I just went out. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Oh, okay. Well, I can still hear you. So we can, can you still, see? I can, can you still see, see okay. I can still see you. Yeah. So we'll keep going and they'll okay. see if we can fix the, there you back. Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So you quite correctly told your kids that if you're doing something over and over, it's it's like part of your wiring. You have. You've wired it into your brain and then by doing it over and over, it becomes very strong. So it feels like it's who you are, but it's not who you are. It's what you've wired in. So you have the ability as a human to stand back and, and observe the messy mind. This is the messy mind. We have mm -hmm. a wise mind. A wise mind is the ability when you give your kids advice, that's your wise mind. When your kids are uh, playing with each other in a friendly way, or helping a friend or we've got, wisdom is all the good loving stuff in us and we can develop our wisdom more and more so we've got a wise mind and a messy mind so when in your cycle we are basically getting the wise mind to work with the messy mind the messy mind is an okay thing it's not a terrible thing it's not that you must get rid of the messy mind you mm -hmm. have to manage the messy mind you cannot avoid having a messy mind which mm -hmm. is nice to know because that's, 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 part of that's extremely nice to know because i hear so many people sorry to interrupt but like just that just the verbiage right the mental mess I mean, so many people that are just like, they say, they self-profess, you know? I mean, my brain is a mess. My life is a mess. My, and, you know, I, I love that, like the fact that you're just kind of, you give us, you give us comfort and, you know, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, and it is okay. So I'm glad you mentioned that because it is okay. Your life will be a mess because that is what life is. It's messy. And it's, but the difference is it's in the mess that you can repair and grow. So the other side of the message that not many people have really heard, but I think it's instinctive. So when I say it, people, ah, you know, they click, is that you can actually manage the mess. So mm -hmm. you don't have to stay in the mess. You have to accept the mess because in accepting the mess, then you can do something about it. You get control over the mess. But if you say, I'm a mess and I can't get out of it, which is mm -hmm. what the current medical model tells you, oh, that's just who you are. You can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. That's despairing. But mm -hmm. if you say, if I tell you, hey, you've made a mess, normal. You're a little, you're an action experimenter. You're a scientist. Mm -hmm. Every human is a scientist. You don't know what's coming up in the events and circumstances of your day. You can't control people. So we have no control over that. We only have control over our responses to those situations. And we're not always is going to have the right right responses someone snaps at you you snap back and it makes the relationship worse you can carry on being messy or you can stop and you can regulate that you can mind manage that and say okay i snapped at you you snapped at me let's resolve this mm -hmm. or you can carry on and get worse and worse and get angry so that's your choice you have you have a choice to do the mess, accept the mess, and regulate mind, manage the mess with the wise mind, or you just stay in the mess. Staying in the mess, it's one or the other. There is no third option. You mm -hmm. either stay messy or you manage your mess. Mm -hmm. And um, and in managing your mess, it's an acceptance. I own it. It's okay. I snapped. I'm, I'm guilty of snapping. I feel shame. The shame's prompting. So instead of shame crushing me and guilt crushing me, I accept the shame and the guilt, and I use it now to work for me. I use it to prompt me to fix. That is so different to, oh, I'm just a mess. Mm -hmm. I'm just shame. I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. It's to shift your perspective, your mindset. You mentioned mindset earlier on. And that's what the neurocycle is kind of teaching you to do. It's teaching you to stand back and observe your own thinking, feeling, and choosing the messy mind and the wise mind. It's mm -hmm. the wise mind is the standing back and observing. And it is helping the messy mind see, okay, I snapped. I'm depressed. I got frustrated, I got irritated, I said nasty words, I gossiped, I'm really down. And it's all, there's no judgment. It's just part of being human. We do it. It's it's really part of it. It's really okay. What's not okay is not to, is to stay there. So I, I can't, I'm like, I can't keep staying in that depression. I can't keep staying in that anxiety. 
I need to start managing it. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm going to automatically overnight get out. There's no cookie cutter formula. Okay, I recognize I'm depressed. I want to get out of it now. Why aren't I out of it in 24 hours? What's wrong with me? No, not at all. It may take you weeks to get out of it. But the fact is that you are man, you are trying to get out of it. You're recognizing that that depression is a, is a signal. It's a warning signal. And you're like a detective. And you're doing the detective work of finding out why you are depressed. And therefore, and that can that in itself can increase your depression. Because when you start seeing, oh gosh, I have this pattern of depression that has been building over years and, and I've had various crashes maybe in my life and um, I was talking to someone just recently who, you know, they spoke about they had a, a sort of crash at 11 and then they had another crash at 13 and another crash at 15 and then eventually as a young adult their life fell apart and that's when they started realizing they need to start addressing some underlying issues. And that's what can happen if we, we can have periods where we get so crushed by the experience of depression. Remember, it's not a being it's a doing that we can feel uh, so crushed that we feel like we can't function but it doesn't mean that your identity is, that you you are crushed it means you're going through something you still got to do the detective work so the point i'm making is it does sometimes take a little bit of time and as you start doing the work and say okay i'm going to now sit down and i'm going to do this neurocycle app i'm going to sit for the 15 to 45 minutes i'm going to go through the five steps what will be revealed in the five steps because it's deeply um it challenges your wise mind to talk to your messy mind it pulls the two sides of the brain to work together it pulls the psycho neurobiology together, drags things out of your cells, out of your brain, out of your mind, and brings it into your conscious awareness. So now you start seeing, gosh, this pattern of depression. Uh oh. Can anybody, we lost Dr. Leaf. It's okay to lose me, but we can't lose her. We are currently working to fix and get her back. So those of you who are listening, we are working on it because I know you have questions and I have more and more uh, questions for her. Um, so many questions about, you know, essentially how to manage the mess and, you know, what do you do when you get into these situations and how do you, you know, help your kids when they get into these situations. So. so much great stuff in her book. And again, if you miss the beginning, it's called Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. She explains it so well. She gives you so many tips and she relates things to stories so it's easy to understand. Um, it's a great uh, a great book. My favorite part of the book is, is at the end when she goes through her routine and Oh, like I, that is so aspirational for me. Like I really want to be able to follow her routine the way she does it. Cause you can tell just when you read it, you're like, okay, clearly this works with the brain. And if you're healthy, your brain's not healthy. And then, you know, your, your body's not going to be healthy. We always um, talk about the importance of having your brain positive and getting those brain waves into your body so that your body can naturally heal itself. So we're still working. Thank you for your patience. Hopefully it'll be resolved soon. Okay, she's she's coming back. See? Not gone that long. We're I was just talking to everybody about your book. So in, while you were gone. <laughs> I coming back. Let's now, see you go. Yay. I'm back. I'm back. Yay. Okay, fantastic. Technology, not always the most reliable thing. <laughs> Technology has a messy mind. Okay, there, yeah. Connie. Technology yeah. had a messy mind, and then yeah. we had the wise mind of your guys helping from in the background there, your tech team, and they were wise mind. They got us back online. There you go. Yeah, there you go. It's a perfect example. <laughs> That's mind management. You make the mess, you manage it. You make the mess, right. you manage it. We're so bad at crushing ourselves and, oh, I'm bad, I'm this, I'm that, because this this 
we had we live in a world of toxic positivity mm-hmm. and you know positive psychology which is think good thoughts and everything will be fine that no, doesn't quite work like that it is mm-hmm. you know it's much more it's much more serious much more intense much more realistic um you know and, and i was saying when we got cut off that you know when you start seeing the source of your years of suppression i mean this happens so often with my patients that and i mean it's happened with myself i'm sure you've experienced this that you see a pattern in your life and you realize gosh I've been doing that because of when you take the time to do the work to find out the why behind the action, the the the, the clue when you see the 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 behaviors and stuff in your life as the symptoms and clues and you see why that can increase anxiety and i actually have an example in the book of one of my case studies in my most recent clinical trials who experienced that exact thing um, where the subject came in saying i am depression so that was their identity and just everything that was wrong with their life so their narrative was just one of brokenness and by 21 days um, of using the neurocycle and, and 20, there's a specific reason you've got to go 63 but at 20 it takes around about 21 days of doing the five steps to start mm-hmm. finding the roots and to start reconceptualizing it into a version that works for you to change you can't get rid of you can't change this it's happened but you can change how it works for you and that takes about 21 days but in the midst of that process like around say day 7 and 14 those are two key areas where the depression in that person increased and the anxiety increased but it was a different kind of depression it wasn't a hopelessness of i'm just lost it was i feel depressed because of what happened to me so it's not no she so not she sorry the subject shifted from i am depression to i feel depressed because of and that in itself is so awful because of what happened and then you get to the point where you recognize that so it takes about three weeks to get to that level and you've taken what you've done is you've pulled this through the five steps you've pulled the toxic issue into the conscious mind and as soon as you do you shift the power balance and you then control this issue and because it's so scary and heavy that's why you have to prepare the brain and all that kind of stuff so I'll I'll come back and explain that in a moment with the five steps but essentially when as you as, as it's in your conscious mind it becomes weakened. And so as you are doing the five steps, you're weakening it even, even, even more. That means the protein bonds are getting weaker, which means the changes in your DNA are happening, which means the changes in your mind are happening. And the energy is never lost in the brain or the body. It's always transferred. So therefore, this is being, as you are working on this, you're getting control over this. This is getting weaker. You're taking energy from here, and you're actually growing a replacement way of thinking about the situation. So eventually by day, more or less within three weeks. If you look closely at this, I'm going to pull a little part of it out. That has now become this. See, this mm-hmm. has now become this little thing. It's still mm-hmm. your story, but it's changed. It still makes you cry. It still makes you sad. It's still mm-hmm. terrible. But you've and it's now planted within how yeah. you are going to see your true identity. How you can now think, feel, and choose. So in other words, you've now changed what's in you Mm -hmm. in response to what's happened to you. Now that happens in around about three weeks. And sometimes only a part of it happens in in those three weeks. But then for the next 42 days, which is kind of phase two. So phase one is 21 days. Doesn't take 21 days to build a habit. That's a myth, okay? It takes 63. So I've got to do another 42 days of work. And then I do just the fifth step. And the first step is practicing an active reach that kind of summarizes this change. And you practice that daily for about one to seven minutes. And I've got an app as well, Connie. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. An app oh, is no. Called, it's called NeuroCycle. So it's great. It goes with the book. It's available. Neuro, NeuroCycle. It's called NeuroCycle. And um, so the name of the actual system, the NeuroCycle, it's available to iTunes and Google Play. And there I literally give you therapy. So I walk you through these 63 days. And then in, in addition, I have the brain preparation. So there's a two two to three minute brain preparation is the five steps and it, I guide you through the process so it's the general process you can learn the system so you can keep using it over and over for whatever you're working on so you just fill in the blank kind of thing you fill in whatever uh-huh. you're working on then I have many guides I have um, the moment is 36 but we keep adding more guides in where it's the five step neurocycle to deal with things like helping anxiety in your children or having if you have a panic attack or if you uh, find yourself ruminating or if you find yourself overthinking something or you find yourself in imposter syndrome so you can scan through those you can pre- Press on those, and in five minutes, I walk you through a neuro cycle to mind manage that moment. So that's and there's a lot of those those examples align a lot with what's in the book. As you see in the second part of the book, is very practical. So that's mm-hmm. kind of the overarching thing. And then coming in, zooming in a little closer, 
your mindset going into the neuro cycle is very important and it's all about that it's okay it's messy mind uh, working with wise mind and um, accepting it you use the word you instead of i and you imagine that you are giving yourself advice so you go in you can even ah. put a chair next to yourself so it's really key and you can put a chair next I, I would do this in therapy with my, my, my with my patients i'd say okay i'm sitting here you sitting there and you sitting there and then have them two chairs and they the the one is the wise mind and then the other one is the messy mind and the wise mind is talking to the messy mind and you say you feeling whatever you this so what does that mean so how can i help you and what do you think about this and so and then you give yourself advice so there's no i you'd remove that oh, I, I've done this bad stuff. You want to get that all away because that causes 1,400 neurophysiological responses to work against you instead of for you. So the setup that I've just given you, this of it's okay, um, we all have it, it's a human response, put the two chairs, use the you, all that is actually shifting 1,400 neurophysiological responses. I'll just tell you about two and um, three. Very quickly, your blood vessels around your heart will dilate instead of constrict, so you'll have more blood flow and more oxygen to your brain. As soon as you have more blood flow and oxygen to the front part of your brain, your impulsivity decreases and your decision-making capability increases. That allows the 200 specialized areas across our brain that are specialized for you uniquely, that enable you to do what no one else can do, are going to be much more interactive and functioning at a higher level. So you are primed to be more effective in your problem solving when you just get yourself into that mindset. I mean, that's mm -hmm. huge. And that in itself is, is huge. Your resilience is increasing. A million other things happen as well, but I won't go into the detail. I do give a lot of examples in the book um, of what happens when you do these five steps. There's a chart, there's a table, there's in my clinical trials. So if you want like evidence that, okay, if I do this, it seems like such an inconsequential thing to say you or to stand back and observe your own thinking by sitting in two chairs, but these are the things that are happening. These are the very positive changes that are happening in your brain and your body that will help you okay so then that's the mindset coming in you can then also um it's very important you prepare your brain in the app i have a two always i have a two to three minute um a little exercise so it's either tapping or havening or meditation or some kind of thing that i lead you through that helps calm the neurochemical chaos in the brain and the body it could be as simple as what I, one of my favorite exercises is the 10 second pause which is where you breathe in for three and out for seven and the extended um, extension, the extended breathing out, pushes more oxygen to the front of your brain and calms down the neurochemical chaos. And there's all kinds of things you can do. There's many different ways of doing the 10 second pause to help you, and I'll give you examples of that. Then you would dive into the five steps. And the five steps need to be done sequentially. You don't mm -hmm. skip any steps. You do them in that order. They that was one of my questions when I was reading. I was wondering that. So that's great. Thank you for answering. Very that. important yeah. because people often think, and this is not a technique. Remember, this is a system. So it's not a quick fix technique that you're going to just do and feel fine in five seconds. Once you've mastered the technique, you can then use it quickly and it works for you because there's a carryover effect, a sustainable carryover effect. But you first have to learn the system. And the best way to learn the system is to work on a pattern, as I mentioned, that you've identified in your life and to, to make that pattern, you know, work on that take something that's really disrupting your life at the moment that you'd really like to get under control that's a great place to start sit down for the 15 to 45 minutes for 21 days and then for the seven minutes over the other 42 days in the app i have built in we have built in a little active reach reminder so you can type in what you're going to do and then it pops up on your phone seven times oh, a day to love remind it. you yeah, which is really great. So it pops up seven times a day to remind you because you need to do your active reach seven times at least during the course of the day. And that also just takes you a few seconds. And then on the 42 days, you need to also consciously be aware of it seven times a day. So that's just one of the, the, the perks there. Okay, so the first step is to gather awareness. And there's a very specific term, reason why I use the term gather. Gather is, if you think of going into a berry a field of berries and you do berry picking you gathering them you choose i like those and i like those and you're putting them in your basket so you're very much in control of the process that's mm. why i use the word gather gather is also a very uh, it's a it's a concept of embracing and i talk a lot in the book about embrace process reconceptualize which is what you're doing with the five steps the overarching philosophy is that you're embracing this issue you're bringing this into your fold when you embrace something you control it as soon as you embrace it you brought it into your conscious mind from the non-conscious mind the non-conscious mind operates 24 7 and is the most intelligent part of you it's where all your thoughts are stored but if they're stored in this form that's what's influencing you so you want to find these and change them so you've got to be very conscious and deliberate about pulling those up and that's what we do when we gather 
we're gathering this into our conscious awareness to weaken it, take the energy away and all that stuff that I've been saying. And so gathering, embracing is I bring it into my fold. I literally welcome it, not because I like what's in there. I welcome it because I don't like what's in there. And the only way I can change it is by embracing it. I have to control it. So you shift the power balance. So you gather awareness. What do you gather awareness of? You gather awareness of your emotional, of all the warning signals. Remember, you're not depression, you're experiencing depression. So you gather awareness of the emotional warning signals. And those are things like depression, anxiety, frustration, irritation, anger, whatever. I have a whole list in the book, and you may have seen it, Connie, in the book of different emotional signals because sometimes we can't think of them on the spot so it's nice just to have a list i also have an emotional warning signal guide where you can rank the level at day one and then as over consecutive days um, i recommend you do the day one four seventeen and fourteen how your emotional intensity changes and so these little things there to help you so you gather awareness of those and then you gather awareness of your physical symptoms related to that so as you think of this issue consciously and you look at the emotions attached to it how are you feeling and then you may feel gut ache or you know severe heart palpitations or you find yourself really tense whatever gather awareness of those because those are telling you something because that's what's in your body and you want to get the body memory out as well as the brain as well as the mind and then you go to gather awareness of your behaviors what are you doing are you kind of more withdrawn than normal are you maybe having cognitive blackouts are you more foggy you can't think is your creativity affected are you more emotional than normal are you crying more what are you doing are you snapping more than normal and there's no judgment remember all the time this is simply your way of coping and what you've done to deal with something that's there so it doesn't mean you are a bad person keep reminding yourself of that okay be as honest and open and then you gather awareness of your perspective what how you what are you, based around this how does this affect how you look at life what is your general mindset and that's also a huge warning signal because if you feel i life sucks it's not worth living you know that's a clear indication that you could be con contemplating suicide or be going down that road and that's where it's really important that you gather awareness and you recognize i'm feeling like this i need to get a support system in place i need to get into therapy i need to make sure i have the support i need and um, that when i'm feeling like this i can talk to someone so it's so important that we train ourselves to gather awareness of those signals and then you start reflecting on them that's the next step when you shine a light through a prism a white light it comes out on the other side all the colors of the rainbow so that shows that white has so much depth every signal is the white light going in but it has depth so what you want to do with reflection is find i feel depression what is the depth what it, what does it mean what does that look like and so you unpack it you start asking answering discussing you look at each signal and you literally start reflecting on each signal and you're starting to build a picture and you're getting detail into this narrative that's going on in your life but it's kind of analytical. Then you write that down. The third step is a writing step. So is the fourth. The third step you write in a, in a system called the Metacog. Now, I really recommend, you don't have to, but if you really want to make this work effectively, you learn how to use a Metacog. It's a way of organizing information on the page that looks like a branch structure. And um, it, I developed this 38 years ago. Uh, there's a similar con thing, concept mapping is similar. Mind mapping is similar. But Metacogging is a lot more detailed and has very specific um, elements to it that enable the two sides of the brain to work together more effectively and for you to introspect deeper and for you to drag things out of the non-conscious that you're not consciously aware of your non-conscious mind which is the biggest part of you and your body and your brain are much more um, much more informed <laughs> than your conscious mind our conscious mind's pretty limited and what we want to do is bring but the conscious mind's got to do the work of the changing so we've got to work with the non-conscious mind and drag that out and this um, gather, reflect, metacog, or how we start bringing this stuff out. The reason that I have asked you, as said, said in the beginning, is keep it limited to 45 minutes is because you don't, you can't deal with too much at once. Mm -hmm. And that's why stuff starts coming up. As soon as you feel overwhelmed, even if you plan to go for 45 minutes and you feel overwhelmed, stop for the day. So it's very, it's a very gracious process. It's very kind to yourself. Then you would go, it's, it's the, the metacog's writing is very messy. It's all over the place. It doesn't make sense. You can use colors and branches and arrows and pictures and just dump. It's a real brain dump but it's powerful especially when you do that branch system and um, then the recheck step is also a writing step 
<clears throat> but it's like a mental autopsy where you go back and you evaluate what you've written on the metacog and you sort it out and you find the triggers and the and the patterns and the antidotes and and antidotes are where you start reconstructing reconceptualizing this is what i'm doing because of this how could i see this differently how would i like it to play out into my life and then you end the session with an act of reach which is a simple action which summarizes the work you've done that day into a statement and you can also add a visual image onto that so something like it could be as simple as um, I am not shame, and a picture of you smiling. It could, that's could, that could just be that's what and you type that in your app, and that pops up. So every time during the day, when your mind wants to go back to that negative, toxic thing, you capture it. You discipline because part of rewiring is discipline. The mm -hmm. discipline, de deliberate, intentionally disciplining your mind not to keep going back. Every time you go back and start ruminating, you're growing it. So you don't want to do that. You want to keep yourself at the level where you ended off today. So every time you're tempted to do that, that's when you do the the act of reach. So I suggest seven times a day, but you can do it as many times as you need to. So as that comes up, you then grab your act of reach and you hang on to that and you force yourself to think of that. And then you can always do a little bit of a brain building exercise to distract yourself. So brain building I put into here as well. It is mm -hmm. a vital component of mental health. It's the same five steps, but instead of breaking something down, you learn something new. So you actually build stuff into your brain. You should be brain building every day anyway. It's one of the most powerful mental health tools for building resilience in your brain. And you'll see in chapter 14, I have my daily routine and brain building is a huge part of it. And I want to tell you, that's what I do mainly in sauna, in my infrared. That is when I do my brain building. I do my research. Um, I sit there with my phone and my iPad and I'm busy doing my brain building. And I have it's difficult writing with because you're sweating. So I don't do it on paper. So I just do it on, on, on technology. But um, brain building is where you're learning. Use the five steps to build information into your brain. It's an incredible way of rebo rebooting, disciplining, um, bringing mental health, etc., etc. So in the book, I have um, the full examples in the second half of the five steps, the table, that story of the jacuzzi, how to do it, lots and lots of examples and applications, and then how to use it for like different types of trauma, big trauma, it's big T trauma, small T trauma, acute trauma, all of us experience trauma. No one's exempt from trauma. No one, everyone experiences depression, anxiety, trauma. If you're human, you can't avoid it because life is filled with adverse circumstances. Every experience that's adverse is a level of trauma. And um, as soon as we get more trauma informed, we will start realizing, okay, that's building something toxic into me. It's affecting my functioning. I need to deal with that. Even the little traumas and then the accumulating traumas over time. So when we become more trauma informed, it's, it's, it's way healthier. So that means that um, we all need to be working on something all the time. Then as you practice that daily, Connie, what happens is you become very effective with the system. Then you can find yourself applying it during the day. And the carryover. So I mean, I'm so used to obviously developing the system it's a lifestyle so i'll use it in the moment like i'll give you a classic an example that just happened i could not get before this thing started i, I was I went into facebook early to go and sort this out now normally my producer who's my daughter dominique she does all of this for me so she sets everything up and i always do instagram lives but i've never done i've only done a couple of facebook lives but i've never set it up myself <laughs> So I was saying that I better work out how to do this quickly and I couldn't. <clears throat> so I was getting totally stressed out. I'd be, I'm totally okay. I got into I got into a level of mental mess. So I quickly did a neurocycle, gathered awareness, did the reflection, did a little um, the little you know, the writing. I just quickly typed a couple of things down. It took me did the five steps. It took me literally three minutes, not even three minutes. I think I did it in less than two minutes. And my action was, okay, let me um, text my other daughter who's more technologically savvy than me because she lives in Seattle. Let me get my husband who actually works these things out and let them work it out while I get ready, which is what I did. So I let them sort it out and I just came and sat down. <laughs> so that was, an, that was an excellent act of reach. There's a silly example of how I got my mind back under control so that I could then be effective in this moment. And I know in the past, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but something happens, it throws you, and you're trying to cope with something, but you're not because your mind's still in that half messy zone and you just don't feel like you give your best. Mm -hmm. So that's where it becomes unbelievably effective in the moment-by-moment -moment living as well. So just as I want to summarize what you just said because I, I – um, I mean, that was just so wise. Um, and I, I want to make sure I also restate it so that I understood what you said correctly. Absolutely. Which, go ahead. which is um, so part of the um, 63 day, because that can be a little daunting. So I just, you know, 
um, because it's like, oh my goodness, that's, you know, a long time. But part of the reason, I I think a lot of people will do things if they understand the why. And part of the why for 63 days is to get yourself into this new pattern, this new wiring, so you have access to it when you do get messy again because it's going to happen. I mean, it happens for me like every day. (laughs) That's that's beautiful. You've explained that beautifully. You see, that's exactly. So, Connie, what you said there is basically a a behavior change has to happen. So for you not to get into that again or to recognize when it's happening and to recognize the trigger and to quickly manage it, you have to have done 63 days. Exactly. It doesn't take 21 days to build a habit. It takes 63. It Mm -hmm. takes 21 days to kind of find out what the mess is and then make and change how you'd like it to look. But for this to actually be something that's happening in your life, a behavior change, and a ha- which comes from a habit, takes the extra 42 days. And it's, that's so simple. Those 42 days, I know it sounds daunting, but in those 42 days, you are just practicing using that in a more conscious way. So you're actually using it after three weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, but you're using it in a very conscious, deliberate way. After the 63 days, it's automatized. It's a habit. Mm-hmm. So therefore, it's very intelligent. You've got this hugely intelligent, wonderful, new, beautiful thought that is so energizing and brain healthy and body healthy mm-hmm. and mind healthy that's now established. So when you're in a situation where that, that particular reaction was triggered before, you now have this to pull on because this no longer exists this remember this has now become this so you see when this is triggered no longer this it's not this anymore when this is triggered this is now changed and it's it's all stuck inside this this then dominates so there'll be a a memory of that but this is what you're going to do and and so for those people who were like me who were thinking guys 63 days that's a long time 60 that's a long like like that's what my brain was doing right yeah but when i hear if I do this for that length of time, I now have access to a system that I can quickly tap into when I am faced with another stressful situation or, or, or anxiety starts to appear. Exactly. And you know, so that to me, and that that's priceless. That's that's yeah. timeless. I mean, that's so worth it. So I, I need to um, move to questions because we're running out of time. I want to do a quick time check with you, Dr. Leap. Are you okay to stay on for a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure. I can do another five, 10 minutes. No problem. Okay. Okay. I, well, I won't take that much of your time, but I would, I want to make sure and get these, the questions answered. And then I also don't want to leave without answering the sleep question um, for, for parents with kids. But, but first I'll get, let's get the questions from the audience. Um, so Jamie asks, what is a good way to help children learn to control anxiety? So what's a good way okay. to help children? Well, basically, control? everything I've said in this in this talk so far is how you control it. So um, the, the answer is anxiety is not an it. The answer is anxiety is a symptom. You're going to have to do the neurocycle. You're going to have to find out why you're anxious. You're going to have to do the whole deconstruction embrace process and reconceptualize into this, which is so when you do the five steps daily over the 21 days and then the fifth step for the 42 days, you are going to find the source of your anxiety because anxiety is simply a symptom, a symptom. and anxiety is going to have other, it's going to have the behaviors, the body symptoms and the perspective attached to it. So you've got to do the process of defining out why and recon- reconceptualizing. That's how you'll get it under control. And then we land up with the situation that we were just talking about now. And in terms okay. of children, it's exactly the same for children. It is question. in the app. There is a, um, a, a section on how to help your kids with anxiety, and we're adding on a lot more. The app is very organic, so if you if you join the the um, if you download the app and you do the uh, the year subscription, you're going to get access to all the new programs for free as they get added, which is really excellent. We're constantly adding new programs. I'm also writing this into books and everything as well for kids. But in the meantime, we're giving a lot of support to the app directly, yeah. so you can hear me teaching it literally. Um, so with kids, you're just going to adapt it down. Now, the best way to help kids is to model it yourself. And so depending on the age, your children under 12, you're going to use a lot of, um, sort of under 10, 11, 12, you're going to use a lot of analogies, a lot of toys, a lot of physical stuff. Um, and you're going to really, that the, the thing of the two chairs is really good for kids. You can also draw, you can also get onto the floor with, with blocks and toys and whatever, depending on, to try and help them to express themselves. You can use, you know, dolls and that kind of thing, depending on, you know, the younger ages, et cetera. Um, your teenagers, um, they are, they are, well, pretty much you can work them through the system, um, the five steps. But the best way to model it is to model it yourself. So if you're having a bad day, one of the things that we have in this, when I grew up, my mom and my 
generation and Connie I think you know I'm older than you I think but we probably had similar upbringing in terms of our parents like kind of hide you suppress your emotions they, they didn't show you know everything was hidden and you, you you mustn't show weakness and you kind of just got to deal with your stuff and you know don't that, that's not so bad and you know that kind of stuff that's the worst thing we can do with kids never invalidate anyone's feelings it, for kid or adults none of us need our feelings invalidated if you're feeling sad because of something, to turn around and say to that person, well, that's not so bad. I know mm. very often we're doing it because we're trying to help them see another perspective, but that doesn't. They feel invalidated. It's way better, no matter what age, is to say, hey, I see that you feel really upset about this. I, I, I can't un- understand what you're going through because it's your experience, but I very much validate. I, for you, I can see that this is really hard for you. How mm. can I support you? What do you need? What do you need from me? And sometimes it's just, can I just sit next to you and hold your hand? Mm-hmm. And that in itself is so validating That's to beautiful. a child. And then they can start maybe trying to express. You can say, do you feel this? Do you feel that? You can even use the emotional words in the book just to say, do you feel these things? And you can start trying to help them express. And then once they start, then you can then you can track through the different signals um, and you can tr- try and work them through the process. Okay, well, let's, you can even draw pictures of a tree and say, okay, let's find the emotional and let's find whatever you can track it through that way down to the roots. And you can do it over time as well, which is going to work. Okay, especially if this is a pattern. If you see that your child is persistently getting more anxious. These are sorry, not persistently, that there's a pattern of anxiety. Remember anxiety is just this vacuous term. It's just a signal. It's a clue. It's your alarm going off and telling your body, hey, I'm a helpful messenger. I'm anxious. Look at me. There's a whole world behind me. There's a whole lot of color behind me that you need to discern. Okay. And then um in terms of what was the other part of that question? Yeah, I think that oh sleep. You wanted to do, to ask about sleep, Connie, or did you, do, you want to do the yeah, question? Um, we can, well, while you're t- talking, if you just want to address, is, is sleep, I don't want to use the word symptom because I don't want to use the wrong words, but it's like if somebody is having trouble, like I was, you know, sharing that, you know, my friend who has, you know, daughters who are really struggle um, from being able to sleep and, and, it, and it becomes like, it's a big deal, you know, for the, for everybody. Is that a result of like, the, the, the toxic tree and they need to go through and that will help or is there something different because it's sleep does it fall outside that no it's so sleep is regenerative we all know we need sleep and it's different there's so much uh, interesting stuff about sleep there's we all have our own natural rhythm um, and th- that's important to understand that and to work that out so there's all that side of sleep and sleep regenerates the brain regenerates the mind does all that so those are the reasons why we need sleep in in summary but essentially sleep begins when you wake up in the morning the most disruptive element of sleep is undealt with issues because our mind is driving everything think of your mind as the 90 to 99 percent and when your mind is working and it's working your mind never stops your mind your non-conscious mind is always going your conscious mind is only awake when you're awake but your non-conscious mind's always going so these are always active And if these are very dominant in your life at the moment, whatever is the most dominant pattern is this dominant thing. So if you're going to sleep with an unresolved issue, then that is going to affect your cycles of REM, non-REM sleep. And we want a certain amount of cycles over a period of seven days. And that's different for every person because of our circadian rhythms, which are determined by our genetics. And then, But then our environments have also disrupted that as well. So but first of all, it's our mind. And our mind is, is the key factor that changes sleep. And then the, the other, the secondary elements are obviously, you know, diet, technology, all those things that we know tons about. And there's so much great advice out there to, to help with that kind of stuff but none of those are really going to work very well unless you do this so you can do all those other things the hyperbaric therapy and the sauna and all that stuff it's definitely going to help it's definitely going to improve but until you manage these you're still going to have periodic sleep issues so i have a whole section in the book on on sleep preparing for sleep and sleep um in the one of the last chapters sleep begins in the morning when you wake up and the way that you transition from wake sleep to wakefulness um it's immediately important to catch how you are doing that because it sets the tone for the day and it sets the tone for how you're going to go to sleep at night and if you wake up and you find yourself complaining um which is kind of common when we feel this when we have disturbed sleep you wake up feeling edgy and 
you know everything's just like irritating and that immediately is creating a set of a state of neurochemical chaos that right. will persist during the day and make you feel edgy and you know that doesn't that doesn't do bode well so it's to catch that state of mind and to make sure okay if i'm feeling like this acknowledge it don't suppress it why work it out and try and shift that and there you could do a quick neurocycle um then i also recommend to do a bit of brain building then as well and even if it's only five minutes it's very good to get your mind into a resilient state and then do the detoxing while you're getting ready or something because that then gives you another level of control over your mind and it's then there's a good chance you're now not going to go to sleep with this unresolved issue but because you're resolving it it will let you sleep easier and then to add things like thinker moments into your day we get so busy we need time to daydream our brain physically needs a rest mm -hmm. we need to activate what we call the default mode network in the in the central networks of the brain and that is right down deep inside and that um, is we do through just switching off to the external not going on your phone sitting in the sun if you can get in the sun and just letting your mind wander for a few minutes and we should do that quite frequently during the day and then you know the bedtime preparation is very important before you just go to sleep just like okay, what what's at the top of my mind what is my most dominant my conscious thought now what's worrying me so it's to do a, a, a sort of regulation check and then then go through a neuro cycle so this is worrying me how can I manage this? Get to a point where, okay, well, I can't solve this today, but I can solve this tomorrow. Now, with your kids, you may have to do this with them. With yourself, you can do it with yourself. And if you do that, I can guarantee, pretty much guarantee that by within 63 days, you would, it'll, it'll happen sooner. Within 21 days, you will be sleeping better. Um, and then within 63 days, it will change. And then I would add into the active reaches each day. I would make sure I add in you know, add in like when, like if I do a sauna at night, it wakes me up. I do saunas in the morning, then I know I'm going to sleep better or early afternoon, but I don't do it just before bedtime because it wakes me up. It may be different for other people. So I know that. So I used to do the sauna last thing before bed and wonder why my mind's so active. So I shifted it to sort of earlier in the evening. So um, it workouts, like work out when you're best. I can't work out in the morning. It makes me exhausted. I work out in the evening. So I'm doing my sauna mainly evening um, workout. And then that is contributing to my sleep. Some of some some other people it's the other way around you know dietary factors as well you know look at what you what you, you know, all the typical how, how real is your food when are you eating there's no one way of eating you know it's just basically to eat real food very mindfully in a way that works out for you so those are not that complicated to build into your routine be very careful of people who give very specific advice you must eat this you must do this you must do this at this time ignore that advice look what the content is because it's probably good content but when anyone says you must be very very careful um the, the only time i would ever say you um, i strongly recommend or uh, advise is to follow this um, the routine of how we get our mind to control the neuroplasticity of our brain because the neuro cycle is changing the neuroplasticity of the brain so you you want that you want all the little things i've just said you want to do that and you want to add the other body things onto it because it then improves the physical health of the brain and that combination is very powerful to improve sleep but then i want to say one more thing about sleep there are going to be nights where you it is just you just right. have a great you just have yep. a great night where you're sitting up with a friend talking all night or yeah. with your with your partner or you just wide awake and you have a creative night i have nights i embrace them i don't fear them if i see okay i'm awake no problem i'm just going to do this and this and this and i work till i'm tired or i do brain building till i'm tired or i watch a movie till i'm tired i use it to do the things that i didn't have time to do during the day i don't get scared of them and our body always catches up this whole thing that your body never catches up is absolute nonsense. They have not proven that. The latest research is showing that within a week, you will sort that out. You'll catch, you eventually catch that up. If wow. you're getting, but the most primary factor, I think, said all of that is you have to get your mind under control. Mind is the most powerful force. So do you have, can you, do you have two more minutes or no? I have two questions that maybe we could do in like 30 seconds each. Two, do you yeah, have two, two minutes? Two quick, yeah, okay. two, because I have two. my next interview is in literally five minutes. So I could do it. Okay, so we'll do it really quick. This first one's real fast. Melissa asks if you have any recommendations for good books or a podcast regarding this topic. Um, well, my podcast is Cleaning Up a Mental Mess, and on that I interview some of the leading experts in the field, and I always have good links to different references, so that's a great place to start. So Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, same name as the book, is my podcast, Perfect. and from there there will be great other great resources. Perfect. And then Kendra asked um, a, a great question. It was kind of what I was thinking when you were going through everything is the hardest part about depression is that first step. And, and again, I want to clarify the hardest part about somebody experiencing depression because it's not a state of being, it's a state of doing, right? What do you recommend to someone who, who is kind of just like 
paralyzed, that feeling of they can't even take that first step, what would you say to them to take that first step? Kindness to yourself. I did a whole podcast on kindness and Perfect. understand what kindness is. And in kindness, understanding what it does in your brain and your body is a great listen. We've had a lot of people who've been in exactly the state who've listened to that, who found that an easy way of giving themselves permission. So so it's listen, understand kindness and then give yourself permission and tell yourself, hey, this messy mind's okay. It's not who I am. I'm amazing. I'm brilliant. Even though I don't feel it, the truth is from a science perspective, I am amazing. I this is my this is not who I am. It's what I'm going to. And then the other thing is, I besides saying all that and it's okay, is that there is a reason why I'm experiencing the signal of depression. There's a reason, and I'll find the reason. So, so that's a good place to get yourself into that. Get that Perfect. into your brain. So um, the my I want to show this very quick visual, and then we'll close that I have when you were talking because I think it may help people understand, um, put into context is when you're talking about how, you know, you can, you are ma we're managing messes. I thought about how when, you know, my son was really little and he would, like would spill Cheerios, you know, and I didn't get upset. I didn't lose. I just said, oh, that's okay, honey. We'll clean it up. And that's kind of what this is all about, yes, right? Yes, it's, it is. It's, 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 it's like my favorite thing that you said is giving yourself permission, being kind to yourself. I always said, it's okay. It's okay, oh, we'll, we'll clean it up. Now, now, if you continue to do that same pattern over and over and over again for the next 15 years, we have another issue. Exactly. But, you know, it's okay. It's okay to make a mess. Yes. It is okay. And I love that wisdom from you. It's all about now we're just going to clean it up. And then we're going to learn and put the new brain waves in there, the ones that, so we don't keep repeating the pattern. And, um, and Dr. Lee has like, the, the information on how to help us all get there and be better, you know, just kinder to ourselves, kinder to our kids, kinder to our husband, kinder to everybody. So I love this. This was awesome. I could just, as always, we can just go on and on and on. So I hate to stop, but I do, I do need to. Thank you all for listening. If you have other questions, please post them. We will get the answers to you. Dr. Leaf, thank you for all your support and light. Thank you for all, all your wisdom and time today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Connie. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. Bye.